You are so confusing. You say you love us, but what, what kind of God allows war? What's going on there? Who are you? The Old Testament showed a wrath and a harshness from God that is totally absent through Jesus. Jesus presented a different view of God, and that's why he's persecuted. Well, which is the real God? Will the real God please stand up? That's what we're going to talk about today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Today I'm continuing to teach a series that I started this last Monday talking about how the, what the real nature of God is like. And I really think that this is essential because there's a lot of confusion. And one of the points that I've been making is that some of the confusion about who God is comes from a misunderstanding of the Bible. Now, I know that that's a startling statement to some people, but you know, there are two different ways that God has dealt with mankind, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, most people are familiar with those terminologies. We know, we know that we have an Old Testament and a New Testament, but some people just think that that's a way of referencing the, uh, you know, the last 26 books of the Bible versus the first ones. And uh, some people don't understand that they are different covenants, different contracts, different ways of God dealing with people. And under the Old Covenant, there was a harshness and a wrath of God that is completely against all of the precepts of the New Testament. Now, I know that some of you here may be thinking that I am really saying some blasphemous things here because, man, you're saying that part of the Bible isn't for us or something. No, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that it is fulfilled and that God has a different way of dealing with sin under the New Covenant that the main thing that has changed is that Jesus bore all of God's wrath and drew all of God's wrath unto himself. And now our sins have been placed upon Jesus. He was punished for our sins, and that allows God to express a mercy and a love and a kindness towards us that was unheard of under the Old Covenant. There are major major differences between the way God deals with people today under this new covenant versus the way that he dealt with people under the old covenant. And sad to say, religion, who is the, you know, the number one way that knowledge about God is released into this earth, even Christian religion as a whole isn't preaching that we are living under the new covenant. Now they will use those words, but again, they'll go back and they will take examples of where God dealt harshly and did this in the old covenant and just come right over into the new covenant and says, that's what God's going to do to you. And I've been showing this week that that's not an accurate representation of God. We use the scriptures out of Luke chapter 9 where Jesus was rejected by the Samaritans and two of his disciples, James and John, wanted to call fire down out of heaven and kill all of these people who had persecuted Jesus. And they said, do you want us to call fire down out of heaven as Elijah did and destroy these people? They even went back to 2 Kings chapter 1 and were trying to follow scriptural example. And how did Jesus respond? Luke chapter 9, verse 55, it says, He rebuked them and said unto them, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy man's life, but to save them. And they just went on to another city. Jesus rebuked his disciples for trying to do what Elijah did in the Old Testament. And so I made this statement on our program yesterday, that if Jesus would have been alive and on earth in his physical body. Now, he did exist as part of the Godhead, but if he would have been in his physical body and having his earthly ministry in 2 Kings chapter 1 where Elijah called fire down out of heaven, Jesus would have rebuked Elijah. That was not the true nature of God. That isn't really the way that God wanted to deal with sin. And personally, I can see that when, you know, the, the third... A uh, soldier came out with his 50 men and implored uh, 
Elijah for mercy and he prayed about it. God told him to go with him and he'll protect him. He could have protected him the first time. He, it was unnecessary to kill these 102 men. Now, I'm not saying that God, it wasn't God's fire that fell because it was. But those people were living under a different dispensation, under a different covenant where the wrath of God was being poured out. And because of it, things happened that could never or would never happen under this new covenant. There is a different way of God dealing with people. And a lack of understanding this has caused a lot of people to confuse who God is. And so there are people today representing that God is the one sending the hurricanes and God is the one sending the tsunamis and the earthquakes and that God has got these countries dangling over hell by a thin thread that's on fire and he's about to judge us and destroy us. Did you know that the church today is proclaiming those things in the name of the Lord and that's a violation of the new covenant? because all of God's wrath has been placed upon Jesus and God is not judging us today the way that he judged people under the old covenant. And they'll go back and say, but look at this scripture and they'll show you Old Testament scriptures, but they can't find you that in the New Testament. Now there are some things that need to be explained here and as I go through this series, I'm going to be talking about all of them. But let me just give you another example. We've already used Luke chapter 9 where Jesus' disciples were rebuked for trying to copy what was done in the Old Testament. There's a difference between the Old Covenant way of doing things and the New Covenant way of doing things. Here's another example is in John chapter 8. And in this instance, there was a woman taken in the very act of adultery. And it says in John chapter 8, it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now here again, you know, the, disciple, uh, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees thought they had Jesus this time. Because according to the law, and they referenced this, Moses gave a commandment that if you caught a man and a woman committing adultery, that they were to be stoned to death. And this is what the law commanded. And the law said that if you don't stone them to death, then you get stoned to death for not enforcing that law. So they thought they had Jesus. Either one of two things would have to happen. To avoid being stoned to death himself... Jesus would have to condemn this woman for the act of adultery and stone her to death. Now, if he did that, all of the grace and the mercy and the teaching that he had been doing about how God loves the sinner would have been just undermined. People would have thought, well, he's no different than the scribes and the Pharisees, and they would have rejected him, and he would have destroyed his own ministry if he would have condemned this woman. Now, that's a major statement right there, and some people don't recognize this. They think that Jesus was teaching the same thing that had always been taught. No, Jesus came preaching the gospel, a brand new way of relating to God, not based on your sins. He gave mercy. He fellowshiped with people that it was prohibited to fellowship with under the old covenant. Jesus showed mercy and love to people in ways that were totally incompatible with the Old Testament. And this is what upset the Jews of that day. And they were against his message. So by bringing this woman to him, they thought if he condemns her and does what the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures command to be done, then we got him. All of his followers are going to leave because they're going to see him as a hypocrite saying God is merciful, but his actions, he's going to kill this woman taken in the act of adultery. So they thought they had him if he went that direction, but if he didn't condemn her, well, then they could stone him to death according to Scripture because he didn't enforce God's judgment. So they thought that this was a catch-22, that there was no way out of this, and they thought that they really had him. You know, this is just andeology. I can't prove this to you, but it does say here in John chapter 8 and in verse 4 that this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. Now, you know what? From my understanding, that means that there had to be not only the woman, but the man. There had to be two people doing this, and yet they only brought the woman. There could be multiple reasons for that, but you know what? I believe one of the reasons probably was 
that it was probably one of these scribes and Pharisees. They probably hired this guy to go into this woman and to do this, and they were looking. That's how they caught him in the very act. It was a setup, and the guy that they had hired or whatever, they led him off and just brought the woman. In other words, they weren't interested in true justice. If they were, they would have brought the man and have wanted both of them killed. They were just out to get Jesus is all they were. They, did, they were using these people. They didn't care about these people. And anyway, they thought they had Jesus. But what Jesus did, he didn't say this woman doesn't deserve to be stoned. He didn't violate the Old Testament scripture. The new covenant isn't a violation of the Old Testament. It's just a fulfillment of it. It's a superseding of it. And so Jesus didn't say, well, the Old Testament never was right, or it doesn't apply, or it doesn't work anymore. That's not what he did. He didn't say that this wasn't sin. And he didn't say that this woman didn't deserve to be stoned to death. What he did was write on the ground with his finger, and we don't know what he wrote, so I won't. The scripture doesn't say, so I won't say. But finally he rose up and he said, he that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the people got convicted by their own conscience because even though this woman was a sinner, they were also sinners. And he said, let those of you without sin cast the first stone. And they all left. And so what he did, he didn't excuse this woman, but he just didn't condemn her. The old covenant only worked until John the Baptist. And since that time, Jesus came preaching a new covenant and he wasn't imputing man's sins unto them. That's what it says, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And so Jesus wasn't operating under the old covenant. He was operating under the new covenant grace, gospel. And he did not hold this woman's sins against her. And later he told this woman, he says, where are your accusers? And uh, hath no man condemned thee? And she said, no man, Lord. And he said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus admitted that this woman had sinned. He didn't say it wasn't sin. He just said, don't do it anymore. And he says, I'm not going to condemn you. There is a huge difference between the way things were handled under the old covenant and the way they're handled under the new covenant. And if you don't understand this, you're going to get a misunderstanding of who God really is that will hinder your relationship. So I've been using some scriptures to illustrate the difference between the way things were done under the old covenant and the way that they're done under the new covenant. And this example that we were just using about the woman taken in the very act of adultery, under the old covenant, the law prescribed she had to be judged, condemned to the point of being stoned to death. In the new covenant, Jesus gave her mercy. Now, if you don't understand that there's a difference between these two covenants and that God's dealings with mankind has changed, then you know what? You would line up on the side with the Pharisees where you would condemn Jesus and say, but the Bible says this, you've got to do this. Yes, it says it. And did you know what? I believe that that was inspired by God. The Old Testament law was given by God, but it was given. And I'm going to expound on this more later. So I encourage you to keep listening to the programs or get the materials because there's a lot more I can say, but I just want to finish up my thought that the Bible shows that the law was given to condemn to kill, to make sin come alive. And there was a period of time where that was a just and righteous thing to do. But now that Jesus has come, the the law, according to Galatians chapter 3, only operated until Jesus came. And it pointed us towards Jesus. It shut us up unto the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Galatians 3 says it was like our schoolmaster to train us when we were children and point us in the right direction. But now that we become adults, we're no longer under that schoolmaster. We are not supposed to be relating to God under this performance-based mentality anymore. We are supposed to be walking in the new covenant, which is infinitely better, infinitely superior. That's what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the Old Testament, it had its own glory, so much glory that Moses literally had to put a veil over his face because his face was, was a shining light, reflecting light. But the New Covenant has so much greater glory that it says in comparison, the First Covenant wasn't even glorious. It didn't have anything good in it compared to what we've got. Our New Covenant is so infinitely better than the Old Testament that was given in the Bible.
that there isn't any comparison between the two. And yet the average person today, the average Christian, does not understand the basic difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. They mix the two together, and because of it, they are living under a guilt and a condemnation that shouldn't exist for the New Testament believer. They aren't enjoying true relationship with God because they don't feel worthy. The truth is we aren't worthy, but the good news is that we aren't getting what we deserve. We are now operating under the grace of God. And even though you don't deserve a relationship with God based on your performance, if you've accepted Jesus, you get all of His goodness, all of His righteousness, all of His holiness applied to you. And you are now in a right standing with God that makes you worthy of receiving everything from God. It's, it's radical difference, radical difference between the Old and the New Covenant. And yet the average Christian doesn't understand that radical difference. You know what the average Christian believes the difference between the Old and the New Covenant is? about one blank page in their Bible. <laughs> That's about it. They don't know that there is a, a true difference in the way that God is dealing with people. And because of this, they look at the Old Testament examples where a death angel went out and killed 186,000 men in one night. And they say, man, if you don't repent, God's liable to do this to you. God's liable to strike you with leprosy, hit you with the botch with cancer, with something, or God is sending an earthquake, or a tidal wave, or a hurricane, and he's bringing judgment. And people today are proclaiming that God is still judging sin the exact same way he did under the old covenant, not understanding that now that Jesus has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing Man sins unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God not only didn't impute people's sins unto them through Jesus, that's why Jesus could forgive this woman taken in the very act of adultery, but he's given us this same ministry of not imputing men's sins unto them, not holding their sins against them. And I'm telling you, this is not the message of the average Christian church today. I am not against church. I am a Christian. I believe that the church is God's institution for this earth. But I tell you what, there's a lot of perversion going on in the average church today. There's been a lot of compromise, and some of it is malicious. But a lot of it is innocent. People just don't know the truth. And, they, and it really, I believe that the bottom line, if you boil it down to, a lot of people have the misconceptions about God and are misrepresenting God because they haven't clearly understood the difference between the Old Testament way of God dealing with people and the New Testament way. And yet it's expounded on in the scriptures a lot. And that's what this whole teaching I'm doing is about. We're trying to explain, is God the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament? Well, the truth is, he's the God of both of them. Well, then somebody says, well, so is God schizophrenic? Is he angry sometimes like the Old Testament and merciful sometimes like the New Testament? Is he the God of Moses that commanded that this woman taken in the act of adultery has to be stoned? Or is he the God of Jesus that gave mercy towards her? These are two different things. And you know, it's amazing. I know that I'm reaching a lot of people who are just thinking, but you're, you're sitting here saying that there's a total difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes, I am. That's a major difference. And some people say, oh, no, no, I believe that we're still supposed to do all of these things. There is a huge difference. And the very fact that we don't even recognize it, the very fact that a lot of people are put off by what I'm saying right here when it is so clearly established in Scripture is quite a testimony to how little this is understood and perceived. And this is why people are misrepresenting God. Many people have an honest and pure heart. They love God. Matter of fact, let me just present it this way. I was raised in church. I was born again when I was eight years old. It was 18 before I really had God fill me with the Holy Spirit and my life took on a purpose. But I mean, I was born again and I loved God, but... I was assuming that all of the things I was taught was correct. And because of it, you know, when I first fell in love with the Lord and wanted to go out and witness to people, 
I remember I'd grab people coming out of a 7-Eleven store. If they had a pack of cigarettes or a case of beer, I'd grab them and say, you're going to hell, repent. And I'd go to bars and pass out tracts that says, repent or else, turn or burn. I'd tell people God was angry at them. Do you know that's the Old Testament method of revealing God? And I did it for a period of time because that's what I'd been taught. And I thought that I was representing God accurately. And this is after I'd had this experience where God showed me His unconditional love for me. The thing that motivated me and got me started was because I had experienced an unconditional love, and yet I went out and started representing a conditional love to people because I hadn't renewed my mind. Your mind is very similar to a computer. If it gets programmed with something, it's going to continue to operate on the programming that was put in there until you reprogram it. And you've got to renew or reprogram your mind. And so I'm saying all of this to say that, you know what, there are some people that are just malicious in misrepresenting God, but there's other people that are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. It's not an accurate representation. So what I'm doing is just I'm trying to systematically begin to go through and show you the difference between the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, why there are two different covenants, how that there is only one true nature of God, which is love, and that God isn't giving us what we deserve. And I tell you, if you can receive this teaching, I believe it's going to make a big difference in your life. You know, let me use another illustration. Some of you are way too young to remember this, but back when I was a kid in the 1950s, I remember that there was a show my parents used to watch, and it was entitled, What's My Line? And they would have a moderator. They would have four people on a panel, and then three people would come in, and they would sign their name, and they, they'd say, you know, their name is John Doe or whatever it was. They'd have some person come in, and all three of these people would pretend to be this mystery guest. And so the panel would ask them questions, find out what their field was and ask questions and try and identify who was telling the truth and who was a liar and stuff. And so after a while, they would all vote and say, I believe it's number one, two or three, whatever. They would put their vote up there. And then the moderator would say, will the real, real Mr. John Doe please stand up? And one would start to stand up, and then another, and they'd go back and forth, and finally the real one would stand up. And it was always interesting to try and guess who was the real person. But, you know, in a sense, here, here's the reason I bring that out, is to say that this is the way some people are about God. God has been so misrepresented and misunderstood that people say, well, is, is God the God of the Old Testament like Elijah that's going to call fire down out of heaven and kill 102 men? Or is he the God of Jesus that rebuked his disciples for wanting to do exactly what Elijah had done? Is he the God of Moses that says, stone this woman to death in John chapter 8? Or is he the God of Jesus that gave mercy to her and says, I'm not going to condemn you? You know, which is it? Will the real God please stand up? That's the way that a lot of people feel. They feel that God is schizophrenic. You don't know if he's in a good mood or a bad mood. I literally had a man come up to me who said that he envisioned God as leaning over the banister of heaven with a lightning bolt just looking for him to do something wrong. And the first time he did something wrong, man, here's the judgment of God. That's how he saw God. You know what, that's fairly typical of the impression that some people get through the Old Testament. But through Jesus, you get a totally different impression. Which is the true nature of God? Well, I tell you, the true nature of God is that He's love and that He's a merciful God. And that begs the question, well, then why the wrath of God of the Old Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. And you know what? That's what I'm teaching on. But I'm going to have to continue this on my program tomorrow. 